Hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for some of you. Welcome today to the virtual Growth Stage Impact Venture Initiative pitching event. We're going to wait just a few minutes to start to wait for our guests to arrive. I just want to say that on the screen, you will see there is a Q&A box. This is for you to alert us if you see any technical glitch. It's also for you to ask questions to our entrepreneurs and we'll do our best and our entrepreneurs will do their best to answer your question and we will follow up afterwards. I should have started by introducing myself. My name is Sarah Bell and I'm a UNDP SDG Finance Geneva Summit Manager. I'm going to be your MC for the next 35 minutes. We're going to start the event. Let me now give the floor to Maria Luisa Silva, UNDP Geneva Office Director for introductory remarks. Maria Luisa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sara. Welcome to this edition of the Growth Stage Impact Ventures Program. Today's journey started in 2019 when UNDP Geneva partnered with the Swiss University Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Los Andes, well reputed APFL, the telecommunications company Orange, and the company and the software company SAP, uh, establishing a rigorous process to select mature ventures developing at scale solutions for achieving the sustainable development goals. Companies from developing countries that had a solid track record of social and environmental impact that contributed to the advancement of the SDGs and that had a sizable investment potential. Our objective was to offer a solid pipeline of SDG aligned investment opportunities with the ultimate goal to show that doing good and doing well was possible, even in the most fragile settings. The success was beyond our expectations. Most of the participating entrepreneurs in the first uh, GSIV increased their annual revenues and raised at least uh, one equity round in 2020, some as high as 5 million. We have also seen the power of the entrepreneur's stories to influence the financial community with new investors considering the SDGs appealing. And for UNDP, this was important. As the UN's leading development agency, we are committed to achieving the SDGs, not only by bringing investments to the sustainable development goals, but also by embedding the SDGs in the finance decision-making processes. During this second GSIV session, we will hear from 12 innovative and very high caliber proposals in the areas of reducing and recovering waste, accessing quality healthcare, and accessing affordable and clean energy. Congratulations to the 12 entrepreneurs pitching today for your excellence your hard work and your success. This year's GSIV takes place in two stages. First, today's virtual pitches to facilitate the start of conversations, and then uh, more in-depth presentations during UNDP's SDGs Finance Summit next December, hopefully during an in-person event. We hope that by making these excellent finalists known earlier and connecting them to the ecosystem, more mature conversations will be possible during the SDGs Finance Geneva Summit. And the summit takes place during the Geneva Building Bridges Week, the Swiss Sustainable Finance Week. And let me use this opportunity to thank the Swiss government for their support. We are humbled and reassured by the interest generated by today's event. More than 700 participants have registered from 89 countries and a diversity of industries. We truly hope uh, you enjoy the pitches and that you will support the scaling of this formidable group of enterprises pitching today. We look forward to seeing you 
at our SDG Finance Geneva Summit in December. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Luisa, for your introduction. We're going to deep dive now in the first pitching session that is focusing on waste. Let me give the floor now to the first entrepreneur, Nameka Ikeguonu, who is the CEO and founder of Cold Hubs in Nigeria. Nameka, the floor is yours. Good luck. Thank you very much for having me and uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning from wherever you are listening. So over the next few minutes, I'll be talking about our work at Code Hubs, deploying solar powered cold storage and the problem that we are addressing. The problem that we are addressing is the problem of food spoilage due to lack of cold storage points along the food supply chain, you know, and the Rockefeller Foundation came out and said that this problem uh, makes 93 million smallholder farmers and retailers all across Nigeria to lose 25% of their annual income. You know, a typical picture when you travel around Nigerian highways is uh, the picture of food that spoils. I mean, food that is dumped on the highways uh, as a result of lack of cold storage in those uh, places. You know, and this problem is uh, exacerbated again due to uh, lack of cold storage and other forms of storage that can be used to extend the shape of this food. You know, next slide, please. Yeah, you know, I was trying to talk about uh, lack of cold storage and the fact that refrigeration, which we all have uh, in our homes, uh, is not existing in Nigerian farms and marketplaces. Uh, because uh, the power grids are not capable of delivering reliable energy and most of the equipment that is available today are really out of touch for an average smallholder farmer to afford. Uh, next slide please. So what, what we do at Code Hubs really is that we actually design, we build, uh, we also uh, operate, maintain 100% uh, solar powered working code rooms in farms in marketplaces, in horticultural produce aggregation centers, and outdoor food markets. You know, uh, these cold rooms are very well designed to meet the specific uh, weather requirement of each site for installation. And it demonstrates a 100% green cooling because we use RO290 refrigerants, which has no global warming or ozone depletion potentials. But aside having technology is that we also have an educational component where we sit down with farmers, educating them about post-harvest management and uh, the, the, the value of having high quality food available for sale. But really what we are doing at Code Hubs is to use these solar powered working cold rooms to extend the shelf life of food from two days to 21 days, reducing wastage. And our revenue model is relatively simple. We charge an equivalent of uh, 50 US cents to store one 20 kilogram plastic crate inside the cold room uh, every day. It is called pay as you store or cooling as a service. And we have operations all driven by ladies. Each cold hub uh, actually is run by a lady hub operator and another market uh, lady market attendant. Uh, over the past four years, we've deployed 54 cold hubs. Last year, we saved 4,000 tons of fruit from spoilage. We increased monthly income of 5,250 farmers, retailers, and wholesalers from 60 US dollar to 120 US dollar every month, created 66 jobs for women, and saved uh, more than 1 million kilograms of CO2. At the moment, we are expanding all across Nigeria. Uh, we have 54 hubs and we are planning to build about 100 new hubs during the year. Um, part of our expansion is also to integrate refrigerated transportation services as part of our business. You know, this is called the Code Hub Logistics. Uh, so we did a pilot about two years ago using refrigerated vans to actually pick up food from our cold rooms in the farm clusters and bring the food all the way down to our cold rooms in the outdoor food markets. It was successful. Now we are planning to expand on it, uh, attaching 10 ton refrigerated trucks to each of our cold rooms and uh, having food moving up and down uh, from the cold rooms and the farms, bringing it to cold rooms in the market. And for that purpose, we are raising 3.5 million US dollars to deploy more cold hubs 
and launch uh, refrigerated transportation services. We strongly believe that if, with five trucks and two trips per day, uh, if we launch it this year, we can achieve uh, more than 500,000 US dollar in revenue. And by 2024, we can do about 1.4 million US dollar in revenue. Uh, the team behind this is myself as CEO, supported by Bright, who is in charge of operations, Maxwell, our technical officer, and Teres, who runs our finance and admin. And we've been supported by a wide range of partners, uh, including uh, development uh, partners and impact investors. So thank you very much, and I'm very sorry for the, the presentation hiccups. Uh, I'll be available to answer any questions at nemeka at coldhubs.com. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nameka. And really sorry for the glitch. That's the beauty of live show. Um, now we're moving to Christine Kagetsu, who is the CEO and co-founder of Sati Pads from India. Christine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, Hi, I'm Kristen, one of the co-founders of Sati, and we make biodegradable and compostable sanitary pads from banana and bamboo fiber. I'm a New Yorker that ended up in Ahmedabad in 2014 to start Sati with my co-founder Tarun, who ex has experience in manufacturing and textiles. We both studied mechanical engineering and found a shared passion for addressing lack of access to menstrual products. In college, I went on my first trip to India with MIT D-Lab and worked on my first sustainable product, realizing then that I wanted to come back to India to make a positive change. We have a team of 11 staff and 15 staff in our manufacturing unit and a diverse team of global advisors. We aim to revolutionize the hygiene industry by making products that are good for your body, the community, and the environment in a sustainable and responsible way. We want to drive systemic change around how menstrual hygiene is addressed and thus drive the shift to a circular economy. That means making sanitary pads that are from sustainable, renewable materials, making them accessible to women no matter where they live, and working with other partners to make sure that our products get upcycled. At Sati, we're addressing three major issues. First, women in both urban and rural areas experience rashes, irritation, and infections, whether it's due to the plastics and chemicals in regular pads or the unhygienic alternatives, such as dirty rags or ash. Second, the lack of menstrual hygiene resources impacts girls' ability to stay in school. Almost 23 million girls drop out of school annually in India. Third, the majority of uh, women using pads in India, uh, sorry, the majority of women using sanitary pads, um, uh, is there's 36% uh, of women using pads in India. That's 21.8 billion pads annually, causing damage to the land and clogging waterways. We address these issues in a holistic way by providing a rash and chemical free experience that's accessible to all and doesn't harm the environment. We're able to do this with our patented technology that converts natural fiber into an absorbent material, which enables us not only to make sanitary pads, but other products as well. We have a holistic business model where we source banana and bamboo fiber from farmers, which we process to make pads in our factory, and then sell these pads to women in urban areas, which subsidizes them for women in rural areas. We have three main sources of revenue. Corporates purchase either plastic credits or pads for their employees. NGOs purchase pads at a subsidized rate for their beneficiaries. And we also sell our pads direct to consumer on our website and through other e-commerce platforms and eco-retailers across India and abroad. We have an innovative cradle-to-cradle -cradle product and business model, which integrates all of our impacts into the supply chain so that as we grow, our impacts grow. We address six of the UN SDGs and measure five metrics. The increase in income to farmers, the number of women we employ um, across our manufacturing unit, the women we reach with our product in both urban and rural areas, and finally, the reduction of plastic waste and CO2 emissions because our pads can be upcycled into compost, biogas, or electricity. As sanitary pads are an essential product for all menstruators, and each menstruator uses 16,000 uh, pads on average in their lifetime, there's a huge global opportunity worth at least $20 billion, with India's market size being at least $550 million. We've already developed and launched our product. We're generating revenue. Our patent was granted. We have a strong supply chain. We have thousands of inbound inquiries and high value LOIs worth $1 million. And we've been recognized by Time Magazine, UN Environment, UNIDO, 
Solar Impulse, and many more for our powerful blend of proprietary technology, innovation, social good, and circularity. We're ready to scale. This is our 18-month scale-up plan. In order to meet demand, we need to purchase equipment and hire key personnel. We're raising a total of $3.5 million for this expansion. During COVID, our revenue took a hit as we weren't able to scale up as planned, but we're, able, uh, we're currently seeing an increase in demand and interest in sustainable products across the world and anticipate significant growth this coming year. In total, we've raised 528,000 in equity and 500,000 in grants and awards over the past five years from various sources, including Village Global, Pipeline Angels, Cartier Women's Initiative Awards, and more. We're currently looking for strategic partners to work with us on scaling Sati to reach new heights. We're raising strategic funding, 1 million in equipment loans and 2.5 million in equity to meet demand and scale. We're looking for strategic distribution partners in the US and India uh, via the UN and through governments. We're also looking for corporate partners to collaborate with us on various initiatives. These are just some of the women we've worked with to date and we aim to make that millions more in the next few years. Join us to ensure women everywhere have access to a safe and eco-friendly period. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. This is so exciting. We're moving now to the third entrepreneur. Let me give now the floor to People Riser, who is the co-founder and director of Alliances Simba from Peru. People, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's exciting to be here. Uh, as said, I'm co-founder of Simba, and I have to say we didn't call it that because we think we're the Lion King, but because we work for a world sin basura, which means without waste in Spanish, because we operate in Peru. And we have a big problem here, because in Lima we produce 10,000 tons of solid waste every day. That's one kilogram per person per day. And when we look at what they contain, if we actually put together the organics and recyclables, both of which obviously could be recovered, we have a potential to recover 78% of the waste generated. But sadly, in Lima, we only recover 4%. So we're wasting a huge potential. And not only that, but when we don't take advantage of these materials, they're basically turning into pollution in a formal system that is feeding landfills uh, creating huge amounts of soil pollution, CO2 emission, and as I said, uh, thousands of tons of wasted resources. But it's also going into an informal system of dumpsters where it's ending up straight in the environment way that's very much related to waste pickers who have to dig through trash and also pig farmers who are actually using organic waste to feed pigs in unhealthy environments, creating meat, obviously, that's unfit as well. And when we look deeper at this problem, we realize that um, scholars were telling us that uh, creating food waste from organic waste actually makes a lot of sense. And we realize that the problem is not necessarily what these farmers do, but how they do it. And it's actually a systemic problem because we have around 8,000 urban informal farmers in Lima. So what we, re what we realized is that we currently have a system that only wa not only wastes thousands of tons of materials that become pollution, but is also marginalizing thousands of people who are offering an important service to society. So that's when we decided to found Simba. As mentioned, we our work is, our purpose is to work for a world Simba Sura, where nothing is left over and no one is left out. Our solution is what we call the Simba cycle. We work with businesses and homes, providing a subscription-based service that includes pickups, processing, training and impact reports. We then work with recyclers to uh, operate the logistical routes. They are actually the ones that take care of recycling all the inorganic material. And we as Simba are specialized in the recycling of organics. This allows us to provide a full circular solution to our clients. And in our bio factory, we turn 100% of organic waste into either animal feed or organic fertilizers, which then become inputs for local farmers who improve their productivity and turn out better products that go back to the population. Our impact along these lines is we've reduced waste pollution for our clients by up to 90%. 
We've created more than 20 formal recycling jobs for in a sector that offers no job opportunities whatsoever. We've recovered over 2,600 tons of materials that translates into a CO2 emissions reduction of about 3,000 tons of CO2 equivalent. And we've worked with 12 local farmers who've increased their productivity by at least 15% thus far. Um, we've achieved a pretty strong client base, but obviously we're looking for growth and the potential is, is pretty big. Um, in our third year of, of operations, we managed to sell around $300,000 at a growth of 200%. Last year, COVID hit us hard, but we look uh, to get back on track this year and hopefully next year uh, have, a, have a big jump and reach the million dollar mark. But if we look at what have we done so far, this little green dot is us in terms of the problem, because the problem is absolutely huge. And that means that the market is absolutely huge. We've calculated that if you managed waste in a circular way in Peru, that would be a $3.2 billion market. And for Latin America, we're talking about over $300 billion. So there's so much to be done. We have a wonderful and passionate team working on this problem and an absolutely diverse team as well. Um, and we're working on growing this year. We're expanding our, our factory uh, 10 times to its, uh, at, to its current capacity. And we are looking to implement a smart materials recovery facility for inorganics that is integrated with data that will combine, uh, will be able to recover 90% of waste materials with traceability, which is super important in this sector. We're currently looking for strategic partners for growth initiatives and, and R&D. And also we're looking for $450,000 in funding in either grants or equity. So we look very much forward to connecting with you. There you can find my email, people at simba.pe. And let's work together to create a world without waste. Thank you. Thank you so much, people. I think the innovation and the preliminary results look just amazing. Now we're moving to our final entrepreneurs. Mayank Mida, is the managing partner and founder of God, Gav Toilets in India. Mayank, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, let's talk shit. Uh, my name is Mayank. I am from Garf Toilets. We are the future of public sanitation. So let me explain. Uh, in most of the developing economies, the community is living in densely populated areas. They're dependent on shared sanitation services. And more often than not, these services are short in supply. They are irregularly maintained and mostly vandalized, which further leads to uh, unsafe sanitation practices, as well as open defecation, which is ultimately the cause of various fatalities and a lot of diseases being spread in these areas. Let us just imagine the plight of uh, millions of women and adolescent girls living in these slum areas. They adjust their bio schedules every day. They go out in the open to relieve themselves in dark hours, ultimately compromising with their dignity as well as safety. So we, we see that this problem is one only going to aggravate in the years to come as the urban population explodes. So we wanted to come into this space with a solution, which is a portable and modular indestructible smart toilet. So this toilet basically is made out of steel so that it cannot be vandalized. It is further reinforced with the insulation that is made out of recycled plastic uh, to maintain an ambient temperature inside the cables. It is an IoT enabled toilet with a lot of sensors. It is powered with solar coupled with gray water recycling as well as uh, biodigester tanks. So these tanks basically help us in, uh, you know, treating the waste uh, in the most efficient, eco-friendly manner. Uh, the waste, when converted, is basically only output that we get is uh, a treated water that can be used as an organic fertilizer around these spaces for landscaping. These toilets are inclusive for women as well as specially able. Uh, for women, we provide uh, sanitary pad vending machines inside the toilets where they can manage their menstrual hygiene properly and also dispose the pads in the most efficient manner. Essentially, these toilets uh, are basically self-cleaning smart toilets which clean by themselves, which flush by themselves through sensor-based operations. They provide us real-time feedback 
as well as help us maintain the user hygiene related data bank. So when I say a data bank, basically this kind of a dashboard, we track the number of users who are coming in to use any given particular toilet. We segregate them by uh, you know gender. We also track how many users have come in, what percentage are washing their hands, how they are managing their hygiene. So basically, if we work with the communities in the long term, we work with them with the help of these precise data points to improve the hygiene practices. So in terms of the business model, we have started to create uh, what we say is a smart sanitation center with the help of the urban local bodies and the smart cities. We work with various uh, corporates as well as NGOs. Uh, we develop and forge long term hybrid annuity contracts on the PPP model as well as to, to basically get access to the land rights as well as uh, the revenue rights where we provide a bouquet of services to the community members that we serve. So apart from providing smart toilet solutions, we provide all the water sanitation and hygiene needs we serve to uh, the end users where they can come and use these services at one stop at a subscription, which is basically less than 10 cents US. So basically all these services help us in making this model sustainable, where we also generate the revenue through outdoor advertising services as well. If we just have to get a snapshot of the overall market, uh, so for India, the sanitation economy definitely has been pegged at about $100 billion in the next two years. If we talk about the smart sanitation economy, it is around $8 billion. And just a snapshot of the urban slum communities, 60% uh, of them do, who do not have access to toilets, they are in just six states, uh, 14 million of them, they present to us an immediate available market of $120 million. So we have worked in various segments globally. Uh, we have worked with various NGOs and CSRs. We reach out to the most underserved communities, uh, 200,000 daily users, more than that, they use our toilets. We have been able to install more than 1,800 toilets uh, in various uh, geographies. The concept has been awarded and acknowledged globally at multiple forums, multiple times. Uh, and we are thankful for that. Our financials, we have grown steadily. Uh, we are scaling up. As of today, we have an order pipeline which is worth more than $2 million. And our gross margins are well above 50%. We are looking to raise a round of $2.5 million to expand our uh, production capacities, to increase our team sizes for operations, as well as R&D, uh, where we are developing new, exciting allied products uh, for the times to come. Um, this is a strong core team. Uh, we are a total team of 37. This is the C suit, which has about more than 50, 15 plus years of experience, average experience into uh, manufacturing, engineering, design, as well as government relations and IP. Um, we impact various SDGs directly and indirectly. And this is the list, uh, as you can see. Uh, I'm available for questions and answers, uh, you know, uh, and at this, uh, these details provided here. My name is Mayank. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayank. And thank you to the four GSIV Waste finalists. We've got now two VIP guests who will take a couple of minutes to comment on the four solutions that we're presenting for reducing and managing waste. Lachlan Cameron will provide the first set of comments. So Lachlan is the Director of Energy and Resource Efficiency at Finance in Motion, one of the world's leading impact asset managers focusing exclusively on development finance in low and middle income countries. Unfortunately, Lachlan couldn't be with us today, but he recorded his comment in a video and we're going to show you this video immediately. Hi, I'm Lachlan Cameron. I'm really sorry that I can't be there uh, live to join the event, um, uh, but I'm really happy to be able to contribute to today. Perhaps before jumping into the sort of comments that I had and thoughts on the finalists that, that you've heard from a little bit about myself and the organization that I'm with. Uh, I'm a director at Finance in Motion, and we're an impact asset management firm based in Frankfurt, although we, we have 16 offices in the, in the markets where we're investing. We're only investing in emerging and uh, so, so low and middle income markets. 
Uh, and to give a sort of sense of scale, we've invested now over the last decade over 5 billion euros um, in, in those geographies. And uh, so our, our mission is to harness the power of finance to uh, benefit people and planet. But that covers a really wide range of ground. So to give some examples, we're investing in, say, two big pillars, um, one on, say, social impacts. And this can be anything from um, small business finance, entrepreneurship support, affordable housing, smallholder agriculture. Uh, and on the other side, we have um, green finance, green, green impact. Um, there we are advising funds that cover a range of things. So there's everything from sustainable energy, energy efficiency, resource efficiency, um, biodiversity protection, sustainable agriculture, forestry, uh, and all of these topics. Um, we're also investing in quite a range of instruments. So a lot of what we do is provide debt to so lending, either through local financial institutions that are our partners, uh, or directly to companies and projects, but also equity, um, whether that's to companies from the funds that we're advising or managing, or that can also be from our own balance sheet when we find the right fit for the right kind of um, company. Um, yeah, so I would encourage you to take a look. Um, we're always looking for, for, for interested people, um, especially at the moment in a sort of growth period uh, where there's been a lot of demand for our services in the last difficult year. Um, yeah, so please, please do come and have a look. So my job here today is to say something uh, happily, uh, say something nice about um, all of the, the, content, the all of the finalists that we've heard from, and, and that's a really easy thing to do. They're a really great set of finalists, really great set of companies. Um, so finalists is almost demeaning. They're really, you know, established businesses with strong track records and really innovative and special business models. Uh, and, and this is a really, really great thing to be hearing from. We've been running our own competition for the last couple of years. Uh, and it's not always that you find such such strong pedigree and such strong finalists. So a little bit on, on each of the four and, and what really stood out from my perspective, I guess, or what would we be looking at as an impact investor when we would be looking at these kinds of companies. So Cold Hubs, um, solar powered storage, uh, cold storage, sorry, uh, is a really deceptively difficult challenge. Um, and, and they do a good job of describing why that is, right? It's all about reliability, off or weak grid applications, system cost, uh, and also how they tackle that, right? They've got their own bespoke and local solutions, uh, their own education programs, their own very simple business model. It's really let them scale to have, you know, 50 systems serving over 5,000 people is really impressive. Um, and they've also figured out that they need to grow on this and connect people to markets and that will grow their business, but it'll also grow the impact that they're having for, for farmers. So. All of this, I think, is great. Uh, they've got an independent corporate governance structure, right? They've got an advisory board that's very trusting and very professional. And they've also been, you know, been able to seek support and investment successfully before. Um, on Sati, the biodegradable sanitary products, they're very clear in laying out who's benefiting. They're able to you know, sort of serve a really wide range of customers and, and also at the same time demonstrate the environmental impact that they're having, but that's also part of their appeal as a product. Um, they've been clear in protecting some intellectual property in the production process. I think that's really important. There are large incumbents in that space. And so being able to do that, I think is, is great. And they're also clear at tracking their, met, their the sort of impact metrics. They know exactly what they're achieving. And they're also even forecasting that and being able to predict what's, you know, what they're going to achieve in the next years. And I think that's really great. Um, and they're clearly managing a very sophisticated retail operation via the e-commerce platforms that they're working with. And they've also got a pretty you know, very significant footprint in terms of markets and clients reached a number of countries that they're exporting to. Really clear use of uh, proceeds for the funding that they're seeking. Um, they know that they know they need to scale. They're also looking to leverage debt alongside the equity that they're seeking. I think all of this is really intelligent and, and well, well laid out. Um, Simba, so this was municipal uh, waste recycling with a focus uh, on, on say organic components. Um, and we've been looking and tracking a number of different companies that, that you know, try to tackle municipal waste in, in markets that aren't served well. And um, these really, these guys really have one of the most sophisticated and, but also clearly successful business models and that they've been able to build here. Uh, this sort of idea of closing this loop and, and connecting not only producers of waste to consumers and then back to producers, I think is really elegant uh, and seems to be really working. Um, they've got these sort of twin twin ideas of working with both businesses, but also households. I think that makes them resilient. I think it gives them more chances to grow. Um, and you can, can sort of see this in the figures and their, their success and plans for the next years. 
Um, and they're, they're really getting real value out of the waste that they're collecting. And they're tackling a part of that process that others, I think, are not so willing or, or able or ready to go into, which is this organic component. That's, that's their speciality. And that's a great niche in a way um, and differentiates them. I think will let them scale to other cities or other markets uh, as well. And they're, they've got a track record in fundraising um, and they're clear on communicating that. So I think uh, all of this sort of shows real strength and success um, for in, in the future for their business. And the last one I have here is the, the GAV Smart Toilets and Sanitation. Their track record and their pipeline is really very clearly impressive. Um, and I just and I won't pretend to be an expert from my own few trips to India, but I, you know the, the scale of the problem is really, really clear. And what I like what they've done is they've taken something familiar, maybe like a, a standalone toilet that has some sort of cleaning functionality built into it and really localized that and then made it relevant to the use case that they see. So they've got sort of their own monitoring, their dashboard, their recycled components, they've got their um, gray water integrated uh, biodigesters sort of fitting the use cases that they see. Um, that's fantastic. They've got their sanitation center, which I think is really interesting. It sort of pushes them a little bit towards um, say more private models and, and away from sort of only relying on say government or philanthropic contracts, which are also perfectly fine business models. Um, so all of these things I, I really liked about um, GAV as well. Yeah, it's a really quick rush through through what you've heard and, and my quick thoughts on that. Um, just to say thank you very much for the, the chance to listen. I find them to be a, a tremendous group of companies uh, and really a great opportunity for anyone listening and considering to invest or support them or, or find other ways to link with them. And I wish you all the best with the rest of the event. That was great. Melati, um, I'm turning to you now. So we have a great pleasure to have Melati we stand with us. She's the founder of Bye Bye Plastic Bags and Youth Topia in Indonesia. And she's one of the key youth climate activists in Asia. Melati, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and hello everybody. I hope that you can hear me uh, well. I must say uh, after Lachlan's review, I'm kind of looking at my notes thinking, okay, okay, I, I uh, wrote a lot of things down. I was so impressed. Congratulations to each and every one of the finalists. Uh, the solutions that were presented were absolutely incredible. And I, I, I wanna dive into the notes um, straight away. First and foremost, I think it's important as a young change maker that I remind everyone of the time that we're living in. It requires action, it requires change, leadership, and true collaboration. And in these last three pitches, um, you know, we really we were reminded of just how big the problem of waste is. We were reminded just how urgent the problem of waste is and in all sorts of different categories whether that was the food waste um the the actual uh, if we look at the pads the the plastic waste as well that goes into all of that so really just seeing again how big and how urgent the issue of waste is right um but we also through these three uh, four pitches sorry the four pitches we saw um that there are already a lot of incredible tangible, scalable solutions that are already here, that are already starting to be implemented and changing everyday behavior. So that is one thing that I was incredibly um, inspired by, whether that was cold hubs in Nigeria, Sati in India, Garf toilets in India, or Simba in Peru. We're just seeing how big of a global movement this is. And me being an island baby from Bali, Indonesia, involved in the in specifically the plastic waste sector, I'm mind blown to see all the different uh, solutions there are in tackling this massive issue of waste. Um, what's interesting as well, what we saw that I really liked in all of the projects is that um, each project covered one or two or three SDGs, which again, just reminds us and just shows how interconnected a lot of these issues are. I loved hearing how uh, in each of the, these projects there was a space to empower women, um, to create safe spaces for young people. Um, I think that was really uh, empowering to see. So again, a little summary from me uh, briefly through all of the projects, as Lachlan said, happily uh, sharing my perspectives as a young change maker this time. Um, 
cold hubs. Now, Mika, first of all, I wanted to say uh, you did awesome with the technical difficulties at the start. Uh, congratulations for pulling yourself together and keeping it through and for the other speakers as well. Um, Cold Hubs tackles such a massive issue with almost, you know, 3 billion tons of food going to waste every year. It's a massive, massive issue. And Cold Hubs creates this amazing solution, um, focusing and empowering on 5,000 farmers already to get involved and part of the solutions as well as looking at renewables. So I think this is a really nice, um, replicable, scalable solution uh, that I hope we'll see also here in Indonesia one day soon. Um, Simba, people, uh, circular systems. I loved how you emphasize that uh, really uh, on the circular systems and the circular economy, uh, uh, how you can really use that as a solution and empowering all members of the community. I think what you said was no waste and leaving no one behind, um, which of course is the goal of all the 17 sustainable development goals. Um, what I think was very impressive already, um, which I really appreciate as a young change maker, you already have 5,700 people trained about sustainable waste management. So again, focusing on that level of education. Um, if we move to Sati Pads, Kristen, as a pl anti-plastic activist, I loved hearing that it was um, plastic, a plastic-free product, uh, chemical-free, uh, biodegradable, um, and besides, uh, Almost 50% of the global human population uh, needs these products when they're on their period. So I think the, the market is huge. The time for these things are right. Um, and, you know, in, in the last I think, three years already, you've proven that you saved 30 metric tons of CO2 emissions um, from entering the uh, atmosphere. So I think that's a huge uh, accomplishment and achievement. Garv Toilets, Mayank. Um, Focusing really on that wash solutions and really localizing it, as Lachlan said. Uh, again, the scalability of this is huge. Uh, the use of technology and showcasing it for how we can use it to be good um, is massive. And I think one of the best things about this is definitely creating those spaces where young women and uh, girls can have those safe spaces, uh, safe toilet spaces. I think one of the last comments that I can contribute to the table or my wish for all of these uh, organizations is to really involve and remember to involve young people in your communities because uh, representing the young generation here on today's uh, call, I think that we can help accelerating the implementation of these solutions and it's all great projects that really need to start entering and changing everyday life. So my wish to all of the projects is to really uh, invite, include uh, young people and all of your decisions, and we will help you implement them every chance we get. So thank you for allowing me to be part of this session, to learn and to listen from you, and to uh, have been allowed the space to share a little bit from me. Thank you so much. Uh, Melativo, it was so refreshing to hear your thought about the, the four finalists. We're moving now to the second pitching session, focusing on health, and I'm handing over to my colleagues, Eva Bortolotti, who is UNDP Geneva Junior Finance Sector Specialist. Um, Eva, I'm happy to give you the floor. Good luck. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sarah. It is really a pleasure to be introducing uh, this pitching session, which will showcase ventures focusing on access to quality healthcare. These ventures develop innovations that help advance health outcomes and access to health services to low income and remote individuals and communities without suffering financial hardship in line with LGBT, good health and well being. So I'm now pleased to give the call to Raton Marain, founder of Bento Health. Hi, I'm Ratul. I'm the founder of uh, Bempu Health. Uh, we're an India-based organization that develops innovations to help newborns survive. Um, I wanted to start by telling you about this mother here. Um, she lives down the street from our office in Bangalore, and her name is Divya. Divya's first baby was born four weeks premature, spent a few weeks in the hospital, 
And then finally, when her baby was discharged home, a few days later, Divya noticed that something just wasn't right with her baby. She was getting blank stares. Her baby wasn't taking food. And so what Divya did then was take her baby back to her back to the hospital. And the, her doctor diagnosed her first baby with a late stage infection. And her baby died a few hours later. This, however, is Divya with her second baby, Ritiksha. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of a different story about Ritiksha. But Divya's story was not unique, and almost four out of every hundred babies in the world don't make it to their fifth birthday. And this is something that I found appalling. So what I did was spend almost a year and a half in the field around India trying to understand firsthand for myself why so many babies were dying and how to what I could do to save them. And at the same time, I was doing secondary um, research, and I understood that the vast number of reasons why babies were dying or facing injury was preventable. So my team and I focused in on one area, which was the prevention and management of hypothermia. And what we found is that if we could manage hypothermia in low weight babies, we could prevent almost half of these babies from dying. So this was a challenge that we took on. And what we innovated then was this tiny bracelet, which we call the temp watch. Uh, this bracelet is given to babies around the time that they're discharged from the hospital and it monitors the baby's temperature day and night for one full month. If the, baby's, if the baby is warm, the bracelet keeps blinking a soft blue light. It looks a little something like this. Um, if, the bracelet is ever, if the baby is ever cold or hypothermic, the bracelet starts blinking a red light, it plays a tune, it wakes up the mother or the father so they can warm the baby well before any hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, any hypoxia, trouble breathing, um, or any permanent injury or death occurs. And when the baby's warm again, the bracelet again starts blinking its soft blue light. But what happened with Divya's second baby, who you saw earlier, was that the bracelet was beeping in the nighttime. Divya tried to warm her, her baby, Ritiksha. The bracelet kept beeping, red, uh, for, uh, kept beeping red for two hours. So Divya took her baby back to the hospital, and the doctor diagnosed that this baby was having persistent hypothermia as a result of it having an underlying infection. We caught that infection early. The doctor treated it with a simple dose of antibiotics and, uh, and, Divya, and Ritiksha survived. If we can catch infections early, even hours early with babies, they have a much better chance of survival. So we developed this bracelet and we launched it in private markets uh, with distributors, but we really hit a sweet spot with UNICEF who was looking at ways to prevent death of newborns in the home. And UNICEF started adopting us and scaling us in countries like Benin, Zimbabwe, Papua New Guinea, Cameroon, Pakistan, Guinea-Bissau, and many more. And what, ben what UNICEF did, as well as several other doctors, did is do a number of valuations that essentially showed that this intervention is accurate, that it has very positive feedback from parents, nurses, and if babies could talk, from babies. And it drives healthy behaviors um, in, like, like more skin-to-skin -skin care. And it has clinical benefits like helping babies gain more weight because they're kept warm over the first month of life. And even more, we had one study done in partnership with the government of Rajasthan in India where they compared babies who were given the bracelet versus babies in their control group and their standard of care that didn't have the bracelet. And what they, what they observed in this pilot study was that babies who wore our bracelet had a 57% better chance of survival than babies who didn't. And in my mind, that lines up with that 50% number that we were targeting uh, in reducing mortality. So with that evidence behind us, we were fortunate to get various approvals and contracts with the Indian government. We were one of Time Magazine's top inventions of 2017. We, of course, have valued UNICEF, one of our largest customer, who has been scaling us in different countries. And we've now helped 35,000 of the world's smallest uh, babies um, in the world. Uh, we have about a half a million dollars in annual revenue. We've been growing at 200% every year. Not only that, but with the evidence behind us and the, and the traction, we were able to launch a whole portfolio of products to help newborns survive. And this is really in line with our vision, which is to eradicate preventable newborn death through innovation, starting with preventing death from neonatal hypothermia. I'm asking for three things from this audience. The first is that if you or someone you know can help sponsor a pilot for one of our public health partners, that serves as a way for them to try out 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 bracelets and then make an evaluation as to whether they wanna incorporate this in their scale-up programs. The second is to introduce us to any large newborn programs, officials or forward-looking doctors who might want to help us reach more babies. 
And the third is connections to strategic partners and investors who can help us reach more babies at the next level. This is one of the best parties I've been to. This is Divya's second baby, Ritiksha's first birthday party with me and my team. Uh, Ritiksha made it, and with your help and, uh, and, and your support, I hope that we can be helping millions of newborns every year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rakul, for the incredible energy. It was really a pleasure to see how game-changing these kind of solutions can be for newborn babies. Uh, so we are now moving to the next uh, pitch, and I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Anuska Kubadia, who is the Chief Commercial Officer of Wula Mobile in South Africa. Dr. Anuska, please, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be representing Vula Mobile this afternoon, sharing with you our exciting, unique journey that we've had in South Africa. Vula Mobile has been started by South African healthcare workers to meet um, a very um, large challenge we face in our healthcare system and in many other healthcare systems across the continent. With the quadruple burden of disease in South Africa, we face um, great pressures on our healthcare system from communicable diseases to non-communicable diseases to violence and injury, and particularly with regard to maternal and child healthcare. We have a very skewed distribution of resources in our country with the majority of resources sitting in the private sector catering for the minority of the population. In an attempt to decentralize the provision of healthcare, government has decentralized many of the um, clinics to rural um, and outlying areas. But unfortunately, most of the specialist resources sit in the urban areas. Vula was started by our founder, Dr. William Mapham, to overcome some of the challenges that frontline healthcare workers face. As patients are referred to primary healthcare clinics in the rural settings, the healthcare system has failed to capacitate these systems with adequate resources and adequate connections to specialist centers to get advice and make referrals when necessary. The letter you see here was written by Dr. William Mapham to a patient who presented with an eye condition. When Dr. William Mapham returned, to the rural clinic many years later, the same patient came back in with the same letter, having gone blind in both eyes. And it was at that point that I realized the patient went blind from an entirely treatable and preventable condition. At that point, Dr. William Mapham started Vula Mobile to connect healthcare workers in rural state settings to specialists in urban areas. And this has really been um, what has facilitated the growth and the progression of Vula Mobile to become one of the largest digital platforms in the country. Vula was introduced as a medical referral platform to help primary workers connect to doctors and specialists, which are discipline specific in urban settings. It allows a frontline worker or a nurse in a rural setting to identify a specialist in a specific um, hospital in an urban area and to seek advice from that specialist as well as make a referral that is timeless and allows the patient to get access to the right level of care at the right point and in the right time. This creates a significant saving for the healthcare system because it ensures that the patient gets access to care when it requires it the most and at the right level that it requires, thereby preventing progression to more complicated disease. How it works is that when a healthcare worker is faced with a patient, they're not sure how to manage in a rural setting. The healthcare worker can enter the app and go to a specific discipline. So for example, if I was faced um, as a, a nurse or a doctor in a rural clinic, with a woman who came in with a large mass in their abdomen, I would immediately be able to do a scan, take a photo and upload that data onto the app and refer that woman to a specialist at a gynae clinic at the nearest tertiary hospital. The specialist 
is able to give me advice in the interim using asynchronous communication to ensure that I manage that patient appropriately while they're waiting for the referral, or if a referral is not necessary, I manage the patient in their home base setting. The system also allows the specialist to receive the patient's advice and information, and this really supports the patient journey as one of the biggest challenges we face when patients move from different nodes in our ecosystem is when they arrive at a tertiary setting and they don't have their information, they don't have their testing results, they don't have their diagnosis, and they don't have an appointment. They are often turned away and they're forced to suffer great hardships in trying to access care again. On the back end, we monitor and we report on all the data that we receive. And we have a massive database of hundreds of thousands of images, testing, biometrics, and clinical outcomes. The impact that we've had to date is immeasurable. There's been over 20,000 healthcare workers registered the, with the platform, and we support more than 4,600 clinics across the country. We've been engaged in more than or almost half a million clinical cases. And in South Africa, a VULA or a case goes through the platform every single minute. We really are an invisible platform that connects the core components of the healthcare system in our fragmented environment. We help connect the patients to the providers and we create a link between the providers and the payers, as well as partners like life sciences and pharmaceutical companies that would like to support patient access programs. Currently, um, we have an asset base of um, 6,000 users, um, which are, sorry, which have grown from 6,000 users, users in 2019 to 20,000. Um, we've had steady growth to a million dollars of revenue in 2021. It's very important for us to keep usage free for public sector healthcare workers. So our model is based on using ad space to help inform, support, and engage with healthcare workers, as well as exploring potential SaaS fees in the private sector environment. To date, we've raised 1.5 million, and now we're looking to raise funding between three to five million to drive our growth. We believe that we could create significant scale using um, the existing learnings that we've had, and we're looking at a Series B equity raise in the future. We would really like to identify investors who would like to support the journey that we're on and help make healthcare accessible to all levels of society. We have a wealth of African healthcare data that we think is really important for uh, decision makers and researchers and policy makers to understand so that we can create African healthcare solutions for the continent. We believe that in a fragmented system that is driven by whether you sit on the public or private side, Vula has a holistic role to play in connecting patients to doctors, to healthcare systems. And we'd really look for your support to either enable us funding access to Vula in a district or in a province, funding the sale of engagement space to like-minded partners, or joining us in our fundraise. Thank you very much for your time and I look forward to engaging with you further. Valuable for us to ask these um, holistic and game changing solutions also at the time of COVID-19 and we thank Ola for all the hard work that it has been doing during this pandemic. So we're now moving to the first speaker and I'm pleased to introduce you to Carlos Pereira, CEO and founder of Libox in Brazil. Carlos, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. My name is Carlos Pereira, and I'm the CEO and founder of Livox. And I'm here today to talk about our life change mission to provide 93 million disabled children opportunities to learn, to communicate, and to grow through technology. And for us, this is personal. Uh, actually, this is, this is a photo of my daughter when she was born 13 years ago and she has cerebral palsy due to a medical mistake. Since from the moment I found out about her disability, empowering people with disabilities became a passion for me. And because of her disability, she can't walk and she can't speak.
But this is not just one issue for my daughter. There are over 100 million uh, children with disabilities, according to the UNICEF. Uh, and these are people with cerebral palsy, autism, Down syndrome, and many other diseases and disabilities that prevent them from speaking or from even um, having a proper education. Uh, and how can we solve that? How can we help these people? Uh, I decided to help my daughter and to help these 100 plus uh, million uh, people with disabilities. I decided to create Livox. And what is Livox? Livox is the world's first disability platform powered by AI. Actually, Livox is three things. The first thing is uh, Livox app. It's a software that enables non-verbal non people with disabilities to communicate and to learn. And it's up to 20 times faster than regular alternative communication devices on the market. And what makes Livox unique, it's all the intelligent algorithms that it has that makes it adapt to different disabilities. So if a person has cerebral palsy, Livox will be very different from a person with autism or Down syndrome, for example. And one of my favorite features of Livox is that, is that you can actually talk to the person with disability. You activate it by saying the name of the person with disability. Livox listens and then helps them to answer. It's very similar to Hey Google, Hey Siri, but instead of saying this, you say the name of the person with disability. My daughter's name is Clara, so I can say something like, uh, Clara, um, are you hungry? Livox understands that, understands that the answer should be yes or no, and then it automatically shows yes or no. And then I can say something like, Clara, Livox starts listening, um, what would you like to eat? Livox understands that, and then it shows options. She's Brazilian, so it shows uh, Brazilian food, so, so she can say, hey, I would like to have, I don't know, uh, rice and beans, for example. And in schools, also, this is very useful because a teacher can say to my daughter, uh, Clara, who was the first American president? The Fox understands that, and then it shows some options. And if she says that it was George Washington, uh, Livox will say, yes, that's that's the correct answer. So it's an extremely powerful tool that enables people with disabilities to communicate and to learn. But the second component of Livox is what we call Livox portal. Uh, Livox is being widely used uh, in hospitals and also in many schools. And through Livox portal, the educational managers, the managers, they can see uh, the improvement over time of all the users of Livox. We evaluate each user in five different categories. Also, Livox is up to 10 times cheaper than current solutions available in the market. And the third component of Livox is what we call Livox Store. Um, when we first created Livox, our users started to create amazing content for people with disabilities, and we wanted to make this widely available. So uh, Livox Store is an amazing way for anyone to create high quality content for people with disabilities that can go from uh, books, uh, alternative communication, lessons like English, math, and etc. We have an exponential growth. Uh, we started to track this metric back in 2019. Uh, we have over 25,000 users with around 10,000 active users daily. Our users have spoken more than 14 million words so far. And we have a repeatable sales model. We sell Livox to schools, government professionals. And when I, I speak about professionals, I'm also including hospitals here. And these are the percentages of our sales to each one of them. We have different price points depending on the country. Uh, and we take into consideration the GDP and the HDI of countries with different price points. We have some powerful growth metrics. We raised over 400. We, we are looking to raise 400,000 K and we already raised uh, 200K so far. Uh, our annual recurring revenue this year was $150,000, and we, we have a forecast for, next year, for this year for 500K. Um, we've been recognized by global leaders from the IDB to Google, MIT, World Economic Forum, uh, the United Nations, I've spoken multiple times, the United Nations in New, New York, Geneva and Vienna, for example. Um, and we have global reach. We are proving, we are present in 10 countries. We are proving that it's possible to deliver high tech even in developing countries like Brazil, Egypt, Sudan, and etc. And that's it. Join us in our life-changing mission to help kids with disabilities to communicate and to learn. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carlos, for your commitment to impact. And we are moving now to the next speaker. This is another Latin American vendor. And I'm pleased to introduce now Camila de Santilis, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Mamotest in Argentina. 
Camilla, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Camilla. I believe healthcare must be universal and high quality for all women. I'm the CEO at Mamatest, a company born in Argentina, as a response to the very alarming amount of women dying every year due to breast cancer. We designed an effective solution to bridge the gap in the health system and give access to high quality mammograms to every woman. The World Health Organization stated that breast cancer is the most common cancer in the world. One of every eight women will develop it along their lifetime. 2.3 million are diagnosed with breast cancer every year. But I want to look at the amount of women that don't get diagnosed. Not having a diagnosis doesn't mean the cancer is not there and it's not killing us. 480,000 women die every year of breast cancer due to systemic failures in developing countries. This is as if the entire population of Zurich and Geneva disappeared every year. Impact on women is exponential. Without a mother, two of every three children in developing countries will not be able to finish school. And in most cases, their family will drop under extreme poverty line. If it is diagnosed in an early stage, breast cancer has a survival rate of 90%, but most women don't have access before they are in an advanced stage, where survival rates drop to less than 27%. Our mission is to create a world where all women have universal access to high quality medical diagnosis, regardless of where they live or their financial situation. Is to give a woman in the middle of Amazonia the same quality diagnosis that someone in Paris will receive. But it is more than just installing the equipment and using teleradiology. It is about empowering women to make decisions on their own health. About making breast studies available with the best physicians for those who don't have the means for intercity traveling or taking a day off of work. About being able to deliver a diagnosis in less than 24 hours as compared to the average six months delay. And most importantly, to deliver an end-to-end -end solution that helps patients diagnosed with breast cancer navigate through inefficient health systems so they can get a treatment on time. As of today, 87% of women diagnosed with breast cancer within our system were able to receive a life-saving treatment on time. As a B-Corp and member of the UN Global Compact, we're constantly measuring our social and economic impact in the world. Last year, we gave access to high-quality diagnosis to more than 60,000 women. 72% of them are at the bottom of the pyramid. With the same amount of money used to treat one patient in an advanced cancer stage, the health system can treat four of them at an early one. This accounts for drugs, chemo, hospitalizations, and procedures, accounting on $1 million savings per mammo test center every year. Our target, including Africa and the Americas, is estimated on 300 million women. This is a $5.8 billion market size. We developed three business models, private centers, private public centers, and telediagnosis services for health institutions. All three models are flexible and adapt to the needs of any context. What is most interesting about this solution is the fact that it is financially sustainable, even in the most challenging markets conditions both private and public sectors. Our adaptable business model is capable of reaching its break-even point in just two years in Argentina, one of the world's most unstable economies. So imagine what we can accomplish in more stable markets. Merck Sharp and Dome was our lead investor in our recent Series A round. We are now looking for an extra $10 million in equities and grants. We are expanding our business to Africa and the Americas. We're looking for powerful partners in the healthcare sector. We're looking for capital partners and grants to join us in this exciting journey 
to help save the women of the world. We don't fear change. We create it. Join us and help 300 million women win a chance to live. You can reach me at camilla at mammotest.net. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Camila. It is really incredible to see, you know, the amount of savings that this kind of solutions can create in the health system. Uh, and thank you also to all the GSIV health finalists and their commitment to democratize access to healthcare through different solutions to improve their health protection, promotion, prevention, treatment, and care. So now we are turning now to the commentators of the session, and I'm pleased to introduce first Anita Cover, who is the Social Finance Program Manager at UBS Optimum Foundation, the leading branch of UBS that offers clients a platform to drive positive social change. Please, Anita, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eva. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to all the, um, all the ventures that presented today. Um, for all that you have achieved and also the um, really great pitches that you just made. Um, so I've been asked to comment um, uh, these four ventures from the investment perspective. Um, uh, first of all, just to give an overview, I think all of the four business models we just saw are innovative in different ways. Bamboo has a breakthrough technology for an issue that has been un underrepresented. Livox is not only targeting a population that has long been ignored by mainstream startups, but it's also doing this through a cutting edge technology. And uh, as for Mammotest, um, while teleradiology platforms have been on the rise, it is really extremely encouraging to see um, a company that has been able to demonstrate um, actual health outcomes and uh, early detection outcomes um, in this space. Um, and for Vula, uh, also, it's really um, in it's a really important communications gap that is being addressed by them between uh, health workers and specialists through technology. So, so I think all of these four enterprises have really interesting business models that address issues that have not really been in the forefront before. And for that reason, they, they can have a good potential for scale. And so for the financial perspective, um, it's really appealing as well to see that all four, comp all four companies have um, been a bit positive, despite the fact that they are still quite early stage and they have actually raised a limited amount of um, external funding to date. Um, and it will be super interesting to see, to follow the growth of these companies, whether as they grow, they are able to maintain this uh, um, bit the positive state. Um, for that, it will be important, I think, for all the companies to keep focus on the unit economics, uh, narrow down on what their one unit is and, uh, and keep that profitable while still growing. Um, yes, and as for the scalability um, and the future plans, I think, for these four ventures in order to really become game changers uh, for SDG3. Um, they will need to iterate further and see how um, they can expand their products into actually verticals. Uh, for example, in the case of Bamboo, it is great that um, Bamboo has a product for hyperthermia and a number of other products as well. It will be important to keep up this pipeline of products for neonatal and prenatal disease diagnostics and cure that they could then continue selling through the same channels that they have already established. Um, similarly for mammotest, uh, mammograms are uh, low cost mammograms reaching populations that haven't been reached before are a great start. But what will be also interesting to see if there are other teleradiology services that uh, mammotest can successfully expand to while still keeping their super strong focus on impact. Um, and um, uh, finally, on the financing, so all four companies are raising funds. Um, before diving into the financing, I think it's just, just important to take a moment to acknowledge that um, impact enterprises often have far fewer resources in terms of funding, access to talent, and so on, compared to their commercial counterparts. Um, at the same time, expectations are 
often higher towards impact enterprises than towards their commercial counterparts. Like we have seen these four enterprises today, they are trying to reach populations that have not been reached before, um, who don't really have access maybe to basic technology, who lack resources otherwise. So, um, and I think most importantly, most of the business models presented today actually rely on, on changing customer behavior, which is a super tall order, order for um, for uh, an impact enterprise. So, so for that reason, when we look at financing, it does make sense for such companies, I believe, to to continue relying on certain amount of grant uh, funding from donors, philanthropists. Uh, um, support from government uh, to develop products, to develop uh, proof of concepts. The next step is then to prove out the business model, so raise social uh, investment capital, soft capital, uh, to prove out that the business is investable. And um, what we have seen in enterprises that we have invested in is uh, while it is super important to keep donors and social investors engaged, most successful enterprises already start developing skills early on to pitch to and interact with more commercial investors. So if uh, the four enterprises today have this type of opportunities, go for it. Um, I stop here. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Anita. It was very relevant to hear your comments about the financial sustainability of these models. So we're now moving to the next speaker, who is uh, Choma Nwakanma. Choma is a youth activist and a medical doctor and the founder of the Smile With Me Foundation, ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all. Please count, Choma, the, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to say a very big thank you to um, UNDP Geneva for this opportunity. And I will also want to start by saying um, congratulations to the 12 finalists of the GSIV speech. It's, it's an honor to be here. And I, I also want to reiterate how inspiring it was for me going through the um, different innovations, especially in the health category. It wasn't just um, an opportunity just you know, for me to read through, but it was also an opportunity for me to learn and also to see how much you know a lot of people are putting in effort to make sure that SDG3, which is held for all people um, across all ages, is realized, especially in developing countries. So I'm just going to quickly go through generally, um, talk through the four innovations that are that are here in this category we have the bento health we have livox uh, mammotest and Vula. i would first start by saying that these solutions are potential game changers for the sdgs uh, because they successfully address the issue of access to health um, generally and then reduction in mortality rates of course and i particularly love how their business models were very inclusive um, particularly involving the people uh, at the bottom of the pyramid, the consumers, and taking into consideration affordability was something I saw across um, all, all um, impacts. And also on the issue of innovation, I want to say that very innovative with the inclusion of digital technology. And I, I like the fact that they didn't just produce or come up with these digital technologies, they actually went the extra mile to educate the users you know on how to properly leverage this technology not just leaving it to them to figure out because i'm someone who is very particular about user experience you know when it comes to apps technology if the user cannot uh, properly use your technology no matter how awesome your idea is is near useless and i like the fact that um the four of them, you know, the four of you made sure that you, you not only included digital technology, you also collaborated with the government, uh, with UN ed agencies, NGOs, and relevant um, organizations, you know, to make sure that what you have is, is spread across and it gets to the people who need it the most. Um, also, I think generally all the impacts were very impressive because, uh, yeah, as I said, they took into consideration affordability. 
Now, going into each of them just briefly, I'll start with mental health. I think um, this particularly touched me because when I was going through the going through the pitch, uh, it took me back to the days when I was working in the neonatal care unit here in Nigeria, and I understand the challenges. One of the things that we were always told as um, young doctors, you know, back then they would tell us always watch the baby and make sure the baby is breathing. Always make sure the baby is breathing. You know, one of the worst things, it was like a signpost in front of the, the neonatal care unit. So if you're just coming into the unit, you know that you need to remember that this baby forgets to breathe. So when I saw this innovation that is taking into consideration, not just hypothermia, but also bradycardia, which is really prevalent in this age um, bracket, you know, especially amongst preterm babies. I was, I was very, I had hope. Let me use that word. I had hope in me that, oh, there's a solution for this. So the temp watch, the acne boots, and also the fact that um, Benko Health didn't just provide the temp watch, you know, and the signals, which is awesome. Also the Kanga sling, you know, um, which took into consideration the fact that skin to skin, uh, that skin to skin moment is something that could be tiring. So it made it easier for parents, you know, to have a longer skin to skin contact with their babies, providing them with the warmth that they need. So, and also I like the fact that they are also working with clinical partners, you know, um, publishing articles and journals, and that's, that's really good because I'm also keen on research. Um, then let's talk about Vula. Um, Vula also personally is something I can relate with. The solution, the problem and the solution is something I can relate with. I like the fact that they not only connect primary healthcare workers, you know, with specialists, which is something that it seems trivial, but those few seconds or those few minutes of delay can actually cost a patient's life. I see it every day and I see how this is a potential game changer, you know, in the healthcare sector in developing nations. And also the, the fact that they didn't just connect them, but then they, they have the electronic medical records available that are trackable so that it, it also reduces the delay or that comes with taking history afresh with each patient. So some patients don't know their history, they don't know the drugs they've been taking. That delay has been bypassed and that's amazing. And then of course the time and the transport money that is saved is also remarkable. Um, and I also love the fact that the system provides for data analysis, you know, and the fact that it's open for research. You know, when um, Anushka was speaking, she talked about how this um, this solution is a game changer in research and talking about tailor-made solutions for the African continent. It's high time Africa started having her own data. You know, when we have our own data, we're able to create solutions that are tailor-made to, you know, to the African continent. And I think this is, this is wonderful. The impact, the fact that healthcare workers, you know, are taken into consideration is, is amazing. The clinics and of course the clinical cases recorded are wonderful. So I want to say kudos. And then, um, of course, we have Livot. And I mean, I would want to say Livot is doing, um, is doing God's work because this is, this is, is awesome. The fact that, um, over 100 million children, according to UNICEF, you know, have disabilities. This, this is, for, for, a lack, for lack of a better word, this is, this is just awesome. It's like a, a walking miracle. So I want to say kudos for this, um, coming up with this. The fact that it's 20 times faster for communication. You also mentioned it's cheaper, 10 times cheaper, uh, because that's, that's something we have to take into consideration. If, you have a product that is not readily available, accessible to people, then you might miss the, your, your target audience. Um, and I also love the fact that when you're scaling, you're, you're involving the schools, the government, professionals, you know, um, and then that the Levox store, the fact that the Levox store is also inclusive for other people to create content that can help you. You're taking into consideration that you can't know it all. So um, it, gives, it involves the society. And I like that. I like that. Um, then finally, uh, let's go to Argentina. Amotest. 
I'm a, I'm a cancer advocate and part of most of the work I do is around cervical and breast cancer awareness, prevention and treatment. So I, I totally understand how important early detection is. I've seen the miracle of early detection and to have a solution that is universal, affordable and still providing high quality services to women is something that we, we should all be grateful for. You know, um, 90 percent. There's a ninety percent survival rate if detected early, um, which was rightly said. And some of the pros that I, I saw were um, the awareness. It includes awareness, not just providing the services, but also inclusive of awareness, access, um, diagnostics, and of course treatment. So um, yeah, I just want to say, just like she closed, Camilla said in her closing remarks, she said, "We don't fear change; we create it." So I'm happy to say that these four innovations um, uh, in the health category are not afraid of change. They are not afraid of in introducing something that has not been heard before or trying to alter things that have existed you know, to create better solutions. They are creating change. And um, I also encourage everybody here, investors, the UN, NGOs, everybody watching to you know, look into this um, great innovations and find out ways that you can partner with them and uh, make our world a better place. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Choma. I think that your views as a medical doctor in Africa have really been an added value to the discussion to understand how this solution can complement the public health system. So we came to the end of the second pitch session. But we have another exciting session before concluding this event. So I invite you to stay online. And I'm now pleased to pass the floor to my colleague, Luisa Bernal, with the policy specialist from the Finance Sector app at UNDP Geneva. Thank you, Eva. And hello, everyone. I, I'm very pleased to be with you this afternoon. And I'm delighted also to present the next fishing session, we are going to hear from four entrepreneurs on how, on their daily work, they help to improve access to affordable and clean energy to those at the bottom of the pyramid. The first um, speaker is Ntasiben Mosia, Chief um, Commercial Officer and Co-Founder of Easy Solar in Sierra Leone. Ntasiben, the floor is yours. The future is young, the future is African, and the future will increasingly also be female. I love this picture because it captures the essence of that future, as well as the unbridled passion of Easy Solar's mission, which is to light up lives. Um, this mission does not come from misguided altruism, um, but from actually a dark place that almost every African can relate to, of what the absence of light means. I, as an African founder, was not able to escape blackouts growing up. Every single woman in this picture and the rest of us, our team has not been able to escape it, that reality. The plain truth is that in Africa, for the vast majority of people, energy is a barrier and not an enabler of development. So why? Why is energy a problem to be addressed and not a reliable, far-reaching and affordable system that powers our future? From Easy Solar's perspective, the problem is twofold. First, it's about grid access. Uh, the markets we operate in, in Sierra Leone and Liberia, are amongst the most grid-constrained globally, with three-quarters of the population lacking access. And when you define access as high-quality and stable power, that figure soars. Secondly, and equally important, the other part of the problem, and something we've realized since founding the company in 2016, is that these markets are not characterized by poor, passive people sitting in the dark, but by economic actors who are conscious of the benefits that power brings, and who are doing whatever it takes of what they have to ensure that they are not without power. Whether that means spending obscene amounts on generator fuel, leaving their phones to charge at a kiosk, or getting whatever lumens are available, whether through torches or candles or oil-based lights. Um, so for us, really, the problem is that people are making myopic short-term investments in poor quality technologies in the absence and sometimes even in the presence of the grid. And none of these options provide sustained peace of mind. So what's our solution? Um, it's to give people the choices um, by offering them high-quality energy solutions that offer guaranteed, um, guaranteed sustained peace of mind. How do we do this? Well, we do it two ways. One way is we make energy accessible 
through a far-reaching last mile distribution network of community-based agents in rural areas and retail stores in urban areas. Um, and these agents and shops are supported by a responsive customer care team um, that ensures that trust and reliability are things that people associate with power provision. We're meeting people where they are, not just physically, but also financially, by offering a range of solar solutions, allowing people to start small, pay an installment, and then upgrade over time based on prior credit history. Beyond this, our major innovation as a company is that we work within the existing payments infrastructure. So we allow people not just to pay in mobile money, but also in cash and sometimes bank deposits. We have a track record to prove that this works, our far-reaching distribution network um, has over 350 sales locations across all of Sierra Leone's districts and a third of Liberia's counties. These agents and shops have sold just under 100,000 products, reaching more than half a million people with a healthy credit portfolio to boot. Um, this is generating economic livelihoods through the direct jobs we create for our agents and brand ambassadors, as well as full-time staff, many of them who are from those communities. And we're generating millions of dollars of savings that people are using to reinvest in other easy solar offers and or just to improve their lives in whichever way they see fit. How do we make money? Well, we've made a conscious decision to focus exclusively on distribution and building long-term relationships with our customers. This means we work with manufacturers and technology providers as partners to bring in high quality, pay-as-you-go enabled products. We finance those on our books using a rent-to-own financing model uh, with payment plans reaching up to 24 months. And as you can see here on this slide, uh, we really have a range of options from $10 Pico lanterns all the way up to $1,000 uh, home systems um, that make up the bulk of our revenue. We're also focusing this year on piloting uh, a productive use range with prices really ranging from $1,000 to $3,000 uh, that are targeted at small businesses looking to increase productivity and save on operating costs. We're also ramping up our power solutions business unit, which offers more conventional rooftop solar and battery generators for residential, commercial, and industrial clients. And we've grown rapidly, um, doubling our customer base and tripling revenue year on year since 2018, um, and finishing off 2020 at $5 million in revenue. And if current trends continue, we'll be EBITDA positive this year, with year-to-date financials already showing we've achieved profitability. To get here, we've raised $10 million in funds, a mix of equity investments, um, with Series A closing just in Q3 of 2020. We've also secured local currency debt to finance working capital and grants to test new product innovations, uh, novel market opportunities, and partnership models. Our goal is to continue scaling up, uh, although slowing the rate of growth um, and, and doubling our customer base and tripling revenue over the next three years, uh, while remaining profitable and having a healthy credit portfolio. So. Um, thank you so much. We're looking to raise about $20 million over the next 12 to 18 months uh, to finance our continued expansion. So if you're keen to join our mission to light up lives and power the future, we're looking for funders and strategic partners to support that growth. Please reach out. My email is on the slide and I'd love to chat. Excellent. Thank you, Antavisa, for such a powerful and clear presentation. Um, I like this very well-rounded approach where you only provide not only a technical solution, but also a financing uh, mechanism to allow those that are uh, at risk of being left behind to, to access um, electricity. Um, so let's move with our further due to the next uh, speaker. And I'm very pleased to present now Manuel Vichers. Manuel is the CEO and founder of Islu Mexico in Mexico. So Manuel, over to you. Thank you. Good morning. Faustina and Juan are a couple that live in the mountain of Guerrero in one of the poorest municipalities in Latin America. Uh, they've been married for 40 years and just five years ago, they uh, purchased a solar home system from Milo, Mexico, and now they have electricity at their home. When asking Faustina about the impact of energy in her life, um, we were surprised by her answer because instead of saying that her children were able to study at night or that the family was able to have more family time or that they were able to extend their working hours. Her first answer was that she was very happy that she was for the first time able to see her partner's eyes at night when they were alone. Uh, this is a beautiful story that makes us wake up every morning and want to do what we are doing today. Unfortunately, there are still 
many couples that are waiting for a similar opportunity. And there are still close to 860 million people in the world that are relying on inefficient, polluting, and hazardous and expensive lighting sources and do not have access to energy today. Fortunately, there are many companies like Easy Solar ourselves and the ones you'll see next that are working on this challenge. And also it's starting to align with the SDGs. So we are promoting that by 2030, we can reach universal energy access in the world. Ilu Mexico's model is based on becoming a service to ensure permanent energy access for families. We are installing tier three and four solar home systems, meaning that families can satisfy their current and future energy needs and aspirations. They have a daily energy budget so they can connect lights, computers, televisions, and even refrig uh, refrigerators. We also promote a permanent and uh, a professional, sorry, I'm hearing some noise on the, in the background. Well, we're promoting professional and, and uh, grid similar installations. So families come into their house and just like you and me can turn on electricity versus plug and play solutions that can move easily and that are need to be replaced constantly. We also design the system so people can grow their energy needs as they grow with us. We're also ensuring that these families is not installing a system and then are abandoned, but we're training local youth, empowering local women entrepreneurs to do top ups and generating financial inclusion through a pay-as-you-go model to ensure a permanent energy access. And we're also investing in technology to ensure that we can remotely monitor any asset that we have in any region in the world through a low-power wide area network that does not require Wi-Fi or any kind of GSM connectivity nearby. Today, we have an important impact. We are now in Mexico, Colombia, and soon in the United States. We have been able to double our impact in the last two years. And today, over 100,000 people in close to 24,000 households have energy with Ilu Mexico service. This is uh, serviced and installed by a network, uh, important network of jobs that we've created, and we have an important social and environmental impact. We are seeing stories of families that are being able to save up to 20% of their income by displacing other sources. And we're also seeing families spending more than two extra hours on education, on income generation and other activities. Uh, we're also seeing families that have a small business that now can refrigerate products like fishermen that are now able to earn five to six times as more than they earned before. And by 2023, we're seeking to reach 100,000 people. Our business model is based on a recurring revenue contract with the customers. Every system that we install is either financed by ourselves or through government or corporates. But regardless of where the capex is coming from, a system is installed in a home and we enter a recurring revenue service contract with families. Families pay top ups according to a flexible way. They can pay by day, by week, by month or in any fashion they want fully offline through a payment agent network that we set up that promotes women entrepreneurs to sell key codes. We become their essentially their utility and we provide them with a service level agreement where we visit their home at least twice a year. We respond to any uh, issues that they might have and we replace the batteries and any kind of assets that they need without any cost. With this, we're collecting data and we're finding out new ways to offer new services for more energy, but also connectivity and other kinds of services. There are still 22 million families living off the grid in Latin America and many more that have intermittent or inefficient diesel or generator access. And we believe that solar can transform their lives and represent a very important economic opportunity. Ilumexico is one of the companies in the solar home system sector that has been able to prove consistent profitability. Since 2016, we've been every positive and we've been able to grow our uh, customer base in an important way in the last years. Uh, we also have, um, thanks to, for example, contracts with the government in Mexico, where we were able to influence public policy. Very interesting years where we were hired to ex extend the 2030 or the 7.1 agenda in Mexico. Uh, we are also, we're, we, we position ourselves as the company that's doing the largest systems in the most offline regions, which is the next frontier market for many companies in the solar system sector. And we're looking to collaborate to support how to reach universal energy access in that last 10% of any country. For that, we're looking for, uh, sorry, we're looking for $5 million in equity uh, in our Series A and an additional debt so we can grow our recurring revenue base and grow our customer base. Also invest in scaling our platforms so we can uh, use in LATAM 
and expand regionally, as we've already done in Colombia and the United States, to become the largest next-gen utility in the, in, the, in the Americas. We already have confirmation from current investors and are looking for new investors to join this challenge and change lives like the one of the Martinez family, who now that they have electricity, can change their the quality of life, the ability to access information, to study, and to overall uh, a platform for development. So we won't stop until every family has access to electricity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manuel, for that challenge that you have posed to all of us, and, um, I, and, and for your very inspirational uh, speech. Uh, let us move now back to Africa, and we will hear from Oki Esse. He's the CEO and founder of Power Stove. Um, Oki, the floor is yours. Climate change is one single problem that affects us that's come to mind globally. When you ask what is the single uh, problem that is affecting us globally, Power Stove is changing the narrative by helping to pay poor and low-income households in last mile communities to cook efficiently. According to World Bank, they say there are 4 billion people globally that cooks with either firewood or charcoal. Now, what this means is that there are a lot of deforestations that's happening and also a lot of amount of greenhouse gas emissions that have been emitted, which is contributed to climate change. So what we are doing at Power Stove is that we are designing and also developing a clean cook stove that also serves generates electricity. Our clean cook stove allows users to be able to pay uh, over a 12 month period and also generates electricity that allows them to charge their mobile phones <coughs> and electrifies their homes. Um, we also make sure that our power stove has an inbuilt IoT device that allows users to be able to um, track and um, gather data and use machine learning to analyze this data so that uh, we can be able to monetize this for carbon credit markets for mutual benefit. Our, in Africa alone, this market is worth $40 billion. And uh, our target market currently is uh, Nigeria that has 30 million households. This 30 million household uh, uh, spends on average $3 billion annually on cooking for our new models to access this market. Um, number one is we are using, we're building partnerships, partnerships with um, large carbon footprint companies to allow them to compensate for their uh, greenhouse gas emissions as we race towards the EU deadline of 2030. Two, we are signing contracts with, um, with international NGOs to help them to distribute and uh, uh, distribute along uh, the last mile communities to solve poverty and hunger and also mitigate climate change and deforestation. Uh, number three, our revenue model is, uh, we are giving the venture capitalists and business angels opportunity to uh, sign contract with us to distribute clean cook stove and monetize the carbon credits where that they can have 100% ROI uh, within 18 months. Uh, in the last, eight, uh, since we started in 2018, we, we ended the, lay, the year on a loss and negative cash flow. A lot of factors contributed to this. One is uh, we're new in the market. We couldn't understand the business model. But those experiences strengthened us in 2019. By 2019, we were able to grow our revenue by 1,300%. Um, last year, despite the COVID challenges, we saw our revenue grew by um, 267,000 with uh, a net profit of $94,600. Now, this year, we are projected to reach over um, half a million dollars in revenue and also be able to expand our revenue by next year to close to a million dollars. Uh, what this means for us is that uh, we are becoming profitable and uh, we've broken even. So we are looking at to raise uh, $3 million in debt, $2 million in, uh, in equity, to help us finance our operations, um, scale our market, and also be able to give the last mile communities opportunity to have access 
to clean an efficient um, cook stove for cooking and lighting. Uh, uh, in a nutshell, what, what we are doing is we are giving our last mile communities a clean cook stove that also saves gens electricity. Uh, my name is Okese. I'm the founder and CEO of Power Stove Energy. Thank you. From Motherland, focusing on, on clean cooking technology, very important for health implications and also for women uh, empowerment and, and, and health. Um, your your mother also have an element of very uh, innovative um, financing uh, to compensate for or to provide carbon credits uh, markets. Um, so I think uh, it's uh, you know very innovative and an interesting model um, that um, we uh, we thank you for for sharing that with us today. Um, let us move to the next um, uh, presenter. Um, so I, um, I'm pleased to to invite uh, Juan Fermín Rodriguez. Um, he is the chief, um, uh, sorry, he's the chairman, executive vice president, and co-founder of Kingo uh, in Guatemala. Uh, Juan Fermín, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, at Kingo, our mission is to turn lives on. Um, there are around 1 billion people around the world without access to electricity. They are the poorest, least healthy, and least educated populations in the world. But ironically enough, they are paying for the most expensive kilowatt hour out there when you compare uh, what the cost of the kilowatt hour is for a candle, a kerosene lamp, or a diesel generator. Also, uh, the cost of extending the traditional grid to these communities is prohibitively expensive. Therefore, that is why we founded Kingo in 2013. We've positioned the company as a rural utility that provides a complete range of, of solar systems and very importantly, prepaid energy services that uh, drive access to um, communities off grid. We have systems ranging from 15 watt uh, solar panels that provide for cell phone charging, lighting and er entertainment to 1100 watt systems that provide for commercial and productive needs. Our business model uh, resembles that of a mix between a distributed utility and the telco. First, we install systems in customers' homes after they pay the deposit. After that, we install in parallel a network of shopkeepers that distribute the prepaid credits. And these shopkeepers make a commission after selling these prepaid credits. Um, then people come into their homes, they insert the, the prepaid code either via a dial pad code or they can do it via an RFID card or if there is coverage via uh, the cell phone connectivity. Although in Latin America, around 60% of uh, communities off the grid don't have cell phone coverage. And in the end, we provide customers with a lifetime service and maintenance warranty. And we also provide them access to life-changing tools such as cell phones, uh, televisions, refrigerators, among others. Our value proposition um, is a holistic one. We have a validated business model of operating these solutions for over 10 years in the market. Um, it's a solution that we can quickly implement at uh, peak months. We've installed up to uh, 4,500 units in one single month. We also deliver a low cost of rural electrification, which is you know, cheaper than extending the posts and the cables to these marginalized and low density communities. And we're also highly competitive against uh, microgrids. Also, our cutting edge proprietary technology allows us to offer long-term solutions, right? We can operate and maintain uh, maintain these units over a long period of time. And very importantly, we're not only able to operate in uh, offline um, landscapes, but we're also able to offset energy theft and energy um, uh, component theft, which is also very prevalent when you're driving um, a service model. Uh, our business verticals, well, we began with uh, our B2C vertical, business to consumer, which is a private uh, vertical with which we scaled in Guatemala and Colombia up to date. Uh, but in parallel, we figured out that both governments and other corporates uh, were interested in our technology and our business model. And therefore, we started launching much larger systems that would benefit these other types of customers. For uh, governments, we're able to, again, substitute the extension of the grid. Um, and through public uh, and private funding, we're able to deliver 
long-term contracts that uh, guarantee sustainability. For business-to-business -business customers, we allow companies like uh, bottling companies or telcos to expand the size of their target market. Uh, essentially, you know, they're only uh, now operating where there's um, electricity coverage. We're able to multiply the size of their market by providing them long-term solutions, either for cold uh, um, solutions or for developing telecommunications, as mentioned before. Uh, to date, we operate close to 30,000 recurring customers in Guatemala and, and Colombia, where we have a pilot. Uh, our objective is to expand to around 150,000 customers in the next three years. We have partnerships uh, in place with local utilities in Guatemala, El Salvador, Panama, and Colombia, where we're looking to seek these B2G customers um, or contracts in parallel to, of course, uh, the other verticals we've mentioned. Uh, our social and environmental impact is vast. Um, of course, uh, with the spearhead of improving quality of life, very specifically, we allow customers to save money. 94% of our customers confirm this. Um, 96 confirm that their productivity has increased. Uh, we've reduced accidents and burns from 56% of households to 0% of households. And of course, each time we install a new system, we are reducing the amount of greenhouse uh, effects in our planet. Um, we've raised uh, around $40 million to date from very reputable investors from development banks like uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, FMO, and Proparco. We've also raised from private equity investors such as CIF and also from utilities like NG and EPM, which is uh, our main partner in Latin America. And last but not least, we're lucky to have Leonardo DiCaprio as, um, as an investor and as an uh, advisor to our board and who has helped us to expand either to other countries, to new investors, or through um, public relation efforts. Um, last but not least, uh, our financing and expansion plan uh, is focused on uh, finishing raising our Series C round, we're pending to close a $12 million ticket. This round was led by CIF and IDB Invest with $5 million each. The Series C includes preferred status, governance rights, downside risks, and, and exit rights. We're also looking to complement this with long-term debt, uh, around $11 million of unsecured and, and, and secured debt. And the use of these proceeds will be utilized in growing our customers, um, our customer base, sorry, in Guatemala from 25,000 to 40,000 customers in the next 12 months, and also investing in the first, uh, you know, large B2G contracts that we're working on in both Guatemala and Colombia. And uh, we're also going to continue um, investing in our business development and R&D capabilities to meet the demands of our uh, ever-growing pipeline in Latin America and beyond. Um, thank you very much for your time, and we invite you uh, to join Kingo in turning lives on around the world. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Juan Fermin, and it's a very powerful presentation again. Um, we have come to the end of the, of the presentation of the entrepreneurs for the um, energy session, and uh, I'm very pleased now to turn to our commentators. Um, the first uh, commentator is Cristina Tora. She is Chief Market Development Officer at the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment. And she has a wealth of experience on, on, on impact and social enterprises. And it's really my pleasure. And we're very thank you, uh, thankful that you are with us, with us today, Cristina. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the four um, presenters and uh, entrepreneurs that have just um, made their presentations. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, as you just mentioned, I'm a Chief Market Development Officer at the GSG. The GSG, uh, just in a very short um, nutshell, is an organization uh, that is a steering group for national advisory boards around the world and we represent today 33 countries and we're working with another range of 20 countries um, to become members of the GSG and uh, these national advisory boards have as a mission to drive more capital towards public good in each one of their countries um, so really um, it's it's great to see the potential investment opportunities that the, that the investors could have um, in the different countries and from around the world. Um, so we, we also work with strategic partners like UNDP and uh, thank, thank you for um, inviting us. Um, I just want to highlight how these uh, four businesses 
are really truly excellent examples of how um, both investors and businesses um, can play a role in accelerating a transition, a transition to um, impact economies, economies where impact becomes a deliberate decision driver for businesses, investors, policymakers, and also for consumers. So, um, and this, you know, as we believe, is is the way for um, uh, an impact-led recovery from the crisis that we're in, and also for building um, more sustainable futures. And the four, four reasons that I'm going to highlight um, are that they have all impact at the heart of their business models. Um, they address several SDGs at the same time. Um, they are very uh, local and uh, user focused and they have great collaborations, partnerships within their core business models. And um, that's that's really to, to say much about um, how they have been developing um, their, their organizations. Um, so first, um, we see that they create solutions um, for social and environmental issues. At the same time, they understand the markets in which they're um, operating and impact is at the heart of their business models. So really what they do is that they harness the market opportunities. Uh, they create opportunities for investors as well uh, while keeping impact creation at the heart of their mission. And uh, one, of the, one of the aspects that I wanted to highlight is um, UNDP has done investor map, um, investor opportunity maps in a number of countries, including, for example, Nigeria. And the Nigerian example um, is, is a perfect illustration of what uh, investors are recommended to do as an accelerator um, for for creating sus more sustainable um, uh, more sustainable countries and economies, um, and um, the um, what we're seeing is that um, given the, the research that UNDP has done, it's um, you know a possible of five to ten percent uh, returns uh, in the short term, given how many Nigerians are um, are using dirty fuels for cooking, and so. Um, what what PowerSoft is um, offering is a really good solution for that. Um, secondly, they address several SDGs at the same time. So they have a very holistic approach. Uh, they address different needs at different times in um, what uh, the users want. So for example, Kingo and Easy, Easy Solar um, have a range of products and services. Uh, they operate almost like a platform for the users, um, they provide also training uh, for, like Kingo offers training for shopkeepers, shopkeepers on digital tools. Um, they allow to drive further financial inclusion through the digital payment tools that they are offering. Um, Easy Solar is is creating credit history uh, through their payment plans. So there is many additional um, benefits uh, from the holistic approach that they're having. Uh, in you know addressing something that could be taken from the energy angle is actually allowing other SDGs to be to be addressed. Um, they are also very local and uh, user focused, so they have a clear understanding um, and engagement uh, of and with their users um, who are actually the people living uh, furthest away from the grids, who are people um, living um, and in poverty and they are integrating them not only as end users but also as their distributors their employees um, so Inu Mexico is for example having uh, flexible payment services for um, their users power stove um, is allowing sort of a, a three-in-one uh, model a very innovative model where they offer clean cooking home lighting and also a direct receipt of um, carbon um, carbon credits, so that uh, that allows uh, not only for for lighting uh, and cooking, but also for uh, improving uh, the livelihoods of, of the people using the um, the power stove. Um, and finally, partnerships and collaboration um, are really also part of uh, everything that they do um, within and and for their business activities. Um, 
And they're looking at, uh, you know, when, when Easy Solar was talking, we were hearing that they work with different uh, partners, namely uh, D-Light, Orange, Rural Energy. So um, depending on what they want to offer, they partner with the most relevant uh, organizations. Um, similarly, Ilu Mexico uh, and Kingo are working with government uh, offices and, and ministries uh, to really roll out um, their, their products. Um, so I was asked, um, how can they maximize uh, their impact? And I was, I was thinking about this. Um, one of the things I was really impressed by is uh, all of them have a focus on, on gender. Um, so I would, I would just encourage all of these entrepreneurs to keep the focus on gender. Um, and uh, we know that it really does generate multiple additional benefits for um for the 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 populations um and uh, and the end users uh namely in healthcare in education uh also in in the protection of, of the environment um so so yeah just just a, an encouragement to to do more of that i was very impressed by power stove's um training and and focus on on hiring women in uh the mobile kiosk and a final, um, a final thought, uh, which is more a call for uh, the participants on the call and who are attending this, um, this meeting. Um, from my perspective, uh, I would like to, to highlight three success factors that will help uh, these entrepreneurs, but also more of these entrepreneurs to, uh, to, to create um, benefits for, for people and planet. One is um, how can we allow um, a more diverse base of investors uh, to look at investing in these kinds of businesses? From our perspective, it's really essential and um, very important that local investors from the countries where they are operating are also considering investing in these businesses. The second is um, what does scale mean? And looking at different considerations around scale, is it uh, widening uh, the, the, um, the impact uh, or is it deepening the impact? Um, I think that what was interesting in, in the presentations was that they had a very uh, deep understanding of the people they were working with. Um, it can be national, it can be international. Uh, widening the impact in one country and uh, ensuring that all of the country um, uh, is served is also a great impact as well. Um, and finally, um, uh, a call to keep developing and keep supporting entrepreneurs like these ones, which are uh, from and for the country um, that have the opportunity to, to come to these platforms um, and other entrepreneurs who, who don't know about this and enable uh, spreading the word about these competitions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, for your very interesting insights. Um, I, I found very interesting your, your highlighting the integrated or holistic approach of the, of the entrepreneurs and their business model. I think it's um, excellent how they can have an accelerator um, impact across the different SDGs, not the least by addressing the gender perspective that you also highlighted. And thank you also for mentioning the SDG investor maps that UNDP is developing. Indeed, we have done, I think, around 16 or 15 of those, uh, more than 20 are planned for this year. And we would like to, to help uh, all the investors, um, both uh, domestic and international, as you mentioned, to, to identify those investment areas to advance the SDGs in developing countries and then further identify um, uh, um, entrepreneurs like the ones that we have heard today that are actually working in those areas and having a positive impact um, for the SDGs in, in, in their countries. Um, so it's my pleasure now to turn to Mateo Salomon. He's a colleague of the gender team, um, no gender team, uh, energy team. <laughs> and uh, he's a global energy and finance advisor. Uh, Mateo, a pleasure to have you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure to be here with uh, all of you and hard to come after all the great comments from uh, from Christina and a very comp comprehensive uh, overview of the of the four impressive solutions that was uh, presented to us today. And I just 
want to start by saying that, uh, unfortunately, we there's still a very large uh, untapped market for uh, energy access companies. So there's a huge potential to growth, which is good for the companies, but it's also uh, a, a challenge for us development partners to seek to uh, bridge the gap and uh, remediate the situation that is uh, very unacceptable that we still have over a third of the population globally which don't have access to technology for clean cooking and one uh, out of 10 people in the world that don't, ha don't have access to reliable and, and, and clean e electricity and the opportunity that uh, this brings. We cannot really see a, a development without uh, energy access. Uh, en energy is really uh, the enabler for all the SDGs and uh, to ensure that uh, countries, uh, economy and, and their population can, can thrive. So the solutions presented to us to today are really uh, essential to actually uh, enable the advances to all uh, the, the other SDGs. And also mention that this year, 2021, is, is actually critical uh, to put the world on the track to achieve the, the SDG 7, uh, including both the energy transition and, and clean energy access, which are the objective of the SDG 7. And we have uh, two key uh, opportunities and events this year that, uh, in addition to the one that we, we, we are participating today, uh, that uh, are calling uh, all uh, the, the countries and different stakeholders from the private sector, civil society, etc., to engage on SDG 7 and accelerate uh, the uh, energy transition and closing the energy access gap. And this is the high-level dialogue that is taking place uh, this year uh, as the first UN, UN summit on energy since 1981. It's a very important event that will take place during the General Assembly uh, of the UN uh, in September and uh, will call all the actors to take uh, action uh, to accelerate uh, the achievement of, of SDG 7. So it's fantastic to see uh, these four companies uh, providing solutions uh, and services that can uh, accelerate uh, this, the, the, the achievement of the SDG 7. And, you know, fantastic to see uh, uh, Easy Solar and the, the combination of payment modalities that it offers for its clients to access their, their services and the range of products from Pico to Solar Home Systems and also now venturing into productive use systems that uh, can uh, offer small and, and medium-sized companies uh, to um, uh, implement their, their, their businesses and, and have a great range of options uh, tailored to, to the different base of, of, of consumers. And also seeing uh, a, a company you know, venturing into the, the West African market. Uh, solar home systems have been growing a lot in, in East Africa and now West Africa is, is also picking up. So it's good to see uh, this, this geographical scope and focus on, 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 on West Africa for growth. Uh, in Ilo Mexico, in, great to see also uh, Ilo Mexico and Kingo, two companies venturing into the, the solar, solar home system and energy as a service for energy access uh, market in, in Latin America. Actually, Latin America is still far behind of Africa in terms of growth for uh, solar home system and energy access but there is still a, a, a very large potential in the number of 22 million people without uh, access to electricity uh, yet to, to cover the gap in, in, in Latin America has been mentioned. And there is a, an, an important potential uh, for these companies to grow uh, in our region with the model that they offer also targeted for different uh, uh, customers need in terms of the size of the service, looking at energy as a service model uh, which is uh, an, an, an essential uh, model to ensure operation and maintenance of the systems. We have seen in the past uh, 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 energy access program failed because of the lack of operation and maintenance of systems, but the systems proposed by Kingo Energy, uh, Ido Mexico and Easy Solar are all 
integrating this uh, energy as a service approach, which can ensure the uh, operation and maintenance of, in the long term of these systems. Uh, also very interesting to see uh, OK, uh, AC, uh, the AC presentation on, on his company power stove and the important health impact that uh, that these solutions can have and the combination of um, uh, of uh, digitalization uh, uh, and digital solutions to track uh, the consumption uh, of, uh, of, of of fuel for the for the cook stoves to uh, um, to be able to access and tap into uh, carbon credits and alternative source of, of revenue uh, for the company and for the for the user of the of the technology. So this is very interesting because one of the challenge of carbon credits has been always the the, the monitoring and verification uh, of the of the of the systems and with the the digital solution integrated in the in the power stove uh, uh, solution, uh, this can be uh, facilitated. So just want to share also a, a few additional uh, a set of comments. I think it's, it's great to see also that all these, all these solutions can uh, bring additional benefits such as financial inclusion and building credit history for the, for the user of the system, which is a, a very important additional benefit. Also, the opportunity for value stacking for these uh, businesses that can combine different type of services, energy service being the first level of, of services that then can be combined with different opportunities, such as uh, providing eff efficient appliances or uh, integrating uh, different type of solution for energy access, combining electricity and cooking. And also, you know, looking into the myth of the bottom of the of the of the pyramid solution and the lack of willingness to pay for this type of services from these these customers and i think that these four solutions that were presented today debunk this myth and allow us now to see that it's actually uh, uh, possible to become profitable providing services uh, to this uh, uh, to this market and uh, and with a potential potential to grow Related to that, uh, as a as a as a comment on on the pitch, this is actually something uh, I think it would be important to show the investor is uh, the 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 quality of your portfolio of of clients and KPIs related to uh, collection rates and non-performing clients because I think this is something that uh, uh, investors wants wants to see to uh, provide uh, confidence in the in the market that the, that. Uh, uh, this type of company are, are tapping. So I think this is, this is actually something, something important to showcase in addition to the profitability, the, some KPIs related to the, to the quality of the, of the portfolio of the company and its clients. And also, uh, reflecting on some, uh, alternative mechanisms that also can, uh, allow these companies to, uh, mobilize additional investments and calling, you know, development financial institutions and partners to look into these solutions such as guarantee facility or liquidity facility that can cover uh, uh, gaps in, in payments from, from, from clients and, in, and protect the assets uh, of these companies. So I think this would be something uh, interesting uh, for us as uh, the development company to, community to reflect on and looking at these alternative uh, financing uh, mechanisms. I also think you know we are coming at a stage looking at the, the maturity of these of these models to look at uh, alternative uh, financial mechanisms to uh, finance receivables from these companies and potentially warehouse those receivables to free cash flow for the companies to continue to 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 grow and uh, pursue the holy grail uh, uh, for paygo companies such as uh, securitization options uh, for uh, this portfolio. So I think there's uh, a huge space to, 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 to grow in this sector. And uh, I would like to call uh, the investor community, the development financial institution community and development organizations such as us, UNDP, to continue uh, engaging uh, in uh, supporting uh, companies such as uh, the four uh, businesses that we have uh, uh, heard the, the pitch today 
to advance in uh, providing uh, services uh, to uh, poor households uh, uh, throughout the world in Latin America and Africa. Thank you very much and uh, great to see uh, these, uh, this business venture and a lot of success to uh, all of you for the continuation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mateo, for all your insights on, uh, on the potential of, uh, of the development of these um, enterprises in the different markets and the different instruments, financial instruments that we are seeing or have the potential to see um, to further develop these type of solutions. Um, dear participants, we are coming to the end of the, the event today, of the Beaches presentation. It has been really a, a very inspirational presentation from uh, our different uh, finalists of the GSIB, as well as great um, uh, thoughtful comment from all the our different commentators through the different uh, thematic areas. I would like to thank you all of them uh, for their contributions. And again, as well to our different partners in the GSIB, so Tech for Impact of EPFL, SAP uh, and Orange, and the government of Switzerland for their very close collaboration and excellent support. Um, I think that it's clear the enterprises and entrepreneurs that we have come to, uh, to meet uh, today are a, a fantastic illustration of the kind of dynamism and ingenuity that is already being deployed um, in developing countries by private enterprises that not only run as um, a viable and profitable businesses, but are also helping to accelerate the realization of the SDGs many times in very difficult context and, and markets. Uh, the GSIB finalists, and you'll be happy to hear this, they will come to Geneva and they will participate in the UNDP SDG Finance Geneva Summit that will take place uh, the, the first week of December uh, here in the city where, where I'm based. Um, this year is the fifth edition of the summit. And this summit basically provides an opportunity for knowledge sharing across the sustainable finance community, development community, also for networking and for partnership building so that we can mobilize and align um, faster and better um, financing uh, to the SDGs, particularly in developing countries. The GSIB finalists will have the opportunity to make a longer pitch, so you will hear of more details on their enterprises, their model, their plans for the future, and they will have the opportunity to interact with the development, finance, and corporate community that uh, typically participate in this summit uh, mostly from Switzerland, but also from Europe at large, um, um, proportionally. But it's open; it's an event open globally. Um, I'm also pleased to to inform that the for the first time this year, the program of the of the summit will include a country focus session that will actually allow for a grounded discussion on what concretely it means for a developing country to mobilize and ally finance to uh, advance the SDGs. What are the very concrete challenges, where are the opportunities? Um, um, this year, we're going to feature Colombia. Um, we are also running a localized GSIB selection process, so we're going to identify great enterprises like the ones we have heard from today, specifically uh, operating in the Colombian market. And the top of the selection uh, will come also to the, to the summit, that you will have the opportunity to interact with them um, to get to know uh, the entrepreneurs, their stories and their plan for, for scaling um, their business and, and the impact that they have. Um, in the weeks and months ahead in preparation for, for the summit, we are planning a number of events that I think you'll be interested uh, to know and participate. So let me give you an overview. The first is next Tuesday already, uh, the 8th of June. We are partnering with the uh, Gender Lens Investment Initiative from Switzerland. Um, we're going to host a webinar um, to uh, illustrate very concrete initiative to align or to incorporate the gender lens into SDG investing. The 21st of June, uh, together with Arena and UNDP Energy Team, we'll be hosting a webinar on challenges, risk, but also the opportunities that there are in financing solar energy for the last mile. The meeting takes place in the Ministerial Thematic Forum of the High Level Dialogue on Energy that is running the week of 21st to 25th of June. Finally, and as part of the broader effort of UNDP to improve the ecosystem for enterprises like the one we heard today to really grow and expand their impact, 
We are organizing local or national presentation of the GSIB finalists in their uh, specific markets. So in the coming two months, we are planning to have these kind of uh, events uh, in Nigeria and India. Um, and then there will, uh, there will be others. So we'll try to cover all the different finalists and their markets. So to stay up to date with these uh, events and the preparation for the summit, please reach out to us and follow us in the social media. You can see the details on the screen right now. And um, if you want to get in touch with the, um, with the entrepreneurs, and we encourage you to do that, please do write to our colleague Eva Portolotti. Her email address is on the screen. We would really like to build a community and start a conversation to accompany our entrepreneurs building towards the summit in December, so that in December they can have very meaningful uh, meetings um, and contacts with the partners that um, hopefully some of you already listening to us uh, will be ready um, so that we can have a very meaningful engagement in December as well. So please do contact us. Uh, we look forward to, to hearing uh, from you or your interest. We're also going to send a survey to those that are indicated interest in contacting the entrepreneurs so that we can uh, understand better your needs and prepare and facilitate the dialogue with you. So please, um, we are coming to an end now. Um, it's been a pleasure and thank you uh, all for joining uh, in this event today. And um, it just reminds me to say, stay tuned, uh, follow us, and thank you so much for, for attending our event. Goodbye.